Coming up on this week's show, we may all be locked inside, but how's the retro gaming industry coping? The Nintendo PlayStation buyer is revealed. And will the PS5 improve your PS1 game? This week's show is brought to you by Harry's and ExpressVPN. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 216, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. Now, isn't it crazy how much things can change in a week? <laughs> it's like, this is probably one of the last times the guys will all get together in the studio, I imagine. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least until we're told we can again. Yeah. Because, I mean, we're actually, um, it's Wednesday night here in the UK, and obviously we know the way the world's been going recently. So we're actually in here. We're going to be in until about 1, 2 in the morning, probably doing three or four shows back-to-back tonight just so we've got some in the bag because it's like, it's crazy. No one knows what's going to happen over the next few weeks. And we want to keep that quality high yeah. as well. One thing I do I have noticed, though, is... A lot of people have been putting on Facebook and stuff, like, you know, everyone else getting logged in, depressed and sad about it. Gamers are like, woohoo! Yeah, no, my wife's been tagging me in all these things, like, you know, can't wait to work from home and all this. I've yeah. got so many games lined up. But <laughs> the issue is, I think I am actually going to be working, like, actually working from right. home because of, I can do my job at home, which is, I don't know if that's a blessing or annoying. <laughs> Joe's going to be that guy <laughs> yeah. doing his work. And if you're a new listener as well, we've got a huge back catalogue as well. So yeah. we've got over 200 episodes that you can listen to. So if you are sat at home, then uh, get going. Absolutely. Yeah, 200 so. hours there for you. Yeah, <laughs> ready well, to go. That's the thing as well. I mean, a lot of people have been, you know, because you work from home, yeah, Ravi. Yeah. And, um, I, it's I did, not much change for me, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. <laughs> I, did, I, I saw that, another meme I saw on Twitter the other day, someone was saying like, uh, when you realise that your everyday life is considered quarantine, and yeah. it's like, yeah, people that work from home anyway. But obviously there is a lot of things that have been affected by it and we'll keep you up to date with anything that's affected in the retro gaming scene. I mean, obviously we had events lined up over the summer. We know that Retro Spill Mesa, for example, has already been delayed to a bit later on this year now yeah. as well. So yeah. um, we'll keep on top of it and we'll keep the podcast coming out every Friday, even if Joe has to do it in his Superman pyjamas at home on Skype. Wow, I can't wait for that now. There you go. He's committed to it. (laughs) Now, we have got a great show this week, though, if you do need something to uh, take your mind off everything that's going on. We've got a brilliant guest. Now, we're going to be joined by Don Daglow. Now, he's had such an interesting career in the video games industry. This is insane, because since we started the podcast, I wanted Don on, and he's like a real video game pioneer. So... Don was creating games in 1971. Yeah. You know, his first game was baseball. And that was because it was the first baseball game. It was just called baseball. Just baseball. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic, <laughs> this talk. He he did one of the first God games, which is called Utopia. Yep. He talks about how he was with Will, Will Wright and nobody wanted to get Sim City. They didn't want to actually take it on. And he was there doing the convincer, yeah. telling them, you know, this game is going to be fantastic. And this interview is great, but we don't even hit... I don't think we get to 16-bit, do we? (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot to cover. Yeah, there's a lot to cover. So we'd have to do a second part with Dom, maybe a a 16-bit part in the future. But this is a fantastic episode with stories about kind of the Bronx in the 70s and stuff. Oh, it's just great. He's a true veteran. And like you said, I think we get up to about the year 1990 with him in this part. (laughs) So we'll have to do a second part with him, but you're going to really enjoy this one. Don is going to be our guest on the show in around 15 minutes from now. Now, of course, we'll be talking about how the uh, coronavirus has affected the retro gaming industry very soon. Um, Also, that big story about the Nintendo PlayStation. Um, There's a really interesting little fact that came out about the guy that bought that that we'll talk about in a second. Now, before we do, let's talk about this week's supporter. These are our good friends at ExpressVPN. Now, what's a VPN? Now, a VPN is a virtual private network, and it basically helps you change your geolocation. So where you're based in the world, you can kind of trick the computers into thinking that you're in different locations, which means you can access different stuff, like Netflix in every country is different. So... You know, if you want to check some Crocodile Dundee out, then you've got Netflix Australia <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> that is, I mean, I've I've always used a VPN for years. And our friends at ExpressVPN, I mean, you know, they do specialise in that. Say, for example, you're at home at the moment, you might have, like, rinsed everything on your local Netflix, you want to change it to another country. It lets you connect to over 100 different countries. All you do is you pick from the list, think about all the different Netflix libraries you can go through. If you love, like, anime, you could expect, you know, if you love anime, you could connect to, like, Japanese Netflix and watch them on there, for example. If you're in America, you want to watch BBT iPlayer, maybe here you want to watch Hulu. There's loads of different things you can do on there. 
And you know, this VPN is the fastest one that I've used. I've used a lot of rival products, but this one is lightning fast and also really easy to install. Other ones I've had to kind of configure the startup menu. This one, select to start on Windows, select to minimize in the system tray. It's really, really useful. And ExpressVPN actually works with all your devices, you know, phones, media consoles, smart TVs as well. If you want to watch Netflix while you're in the bath on your phone, you can do that. You can watch it on the go wherever you are if you're staying in a hotel, for example. And we want you to try ExpressVPN. So when Ravi tried it out, you actually did say to me, you've used loads of VPNs in the past. This was like for streaming HD video. No oh, lag, no buffering. It's so good. And also, it's not very resource hungry as yeah. well. So it's quite lightweight where I've had other ones and, you know, you've ran them on your phone. Your phone power's just draining. <laughs> well, if you want to try it out for yourself and you'll be helping out the podcast for doing this, all you've got to do is nip on to expressvpn.com slash retro and you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Try it out, support the show, watch what you want. Perfect timing as well if you are staying indoors at the moment and get yourself protected at expressvpn.com slash retro. Right, of course, let's talk about the... Um the situation at the moment, I mean, the retro industry is obviously going to be affected because a lot of it's made, a lot of the you know, hardware, for example, is manufactured in China. So obviously that's having a knock-on effect. Yeah, and a lot of these Kickstarters, so I've I've backed a lot of Kickstarters and I've got messages through saying, you know, um, we can't actually deliver this because the factories shut down. Yeah, And, you know, a lot of these Kickstarters are created in small factories in China because they're small runs. They're very like specialist kind yeah. of stuff or, or injection yeah, molded you make a stuff. Of them or whatever, yeah, exactly. Than, like, and that's of them. Yeah. and that's starting to affect the industry. And I'm sure there's going to be many job losses as as we're seeing at the moment. It's, yeah. it's awful. But um, one of the main delays has been the Turbo Graphic 16 Mini, um, the retro console. That one's actually been put in delay, so we don't know how long. That's going to be so. What have they, have they just said? That's it's just not coming. Delayed in until further notice. Yeah. Oh, really? But yeah, yeah. no one knows how long it's going to last, do they? Yeah. It's, it's so hard at the moment even to plan what you're going to do in your life tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, yeah, it is an unfortunate consequence of what's happening, especially now. You know, when you are at home and you want and, to play on your games, yeah. and it's yeah. not just affecting the older game system as well. Yeah. It's affecting Switch production at the moment. Mm-hmm. So they're saying uh, the Ring Fit Adventure has been affected and the new Animal. Uh, crossing. Yeah, yeah. Well, good excuse to get your old console out the attic and uh, give it a bit of love again, I think, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about the Nintendo PlayStation. Now, obviously, this prototype. Um, now, you were off last time we talked about it, Ravi. How much? Well, we did predictions. You about had, how much? I did a stupidly big one. Over a million. <laughs> I, I over a million, said, yeah. yeah. You've had, Ravi's had like mixed ones, though, because you've said before you thought you felt like another one might I don't think you said this on on air, but there, there might be a few more. There might yeah, be a yeah. few more, uh, which I thought was actually actually like, yeah, that, what a few more prototypes. Yeah, yeah, okay. might, there might be one or two more, yeah. which would kind of like come out when you know somebody might go like, well, I've got one as well. Mm. As soon as it went up for auction, but obviously that never happened. But I can't remember what we said. Well, they where they mentioned in the actual auction listing, they said this may be one of. You know, they said there might be more discovered okay. on, yeah. on the actual listing after it's sold. But you know, I think it's. It's about the price of a house in the UK. Yeah, I mean, it's still a, a decent fair, house. It's a fair wedge of so cash. So it's three hundred and sixty thousand, wasn't it? It went for three hundred thousand, and then a sixty thousand dollars as well. So three hundred thousand dollars, but then there was a sixty thousand like premium on top of it, or right, something. Right, okay. They had to pay for the auction or something like that. So essentially, when me and you were talking about it about two or three weeks ago, it never really went. It no, didn't move. Yeah. It didn't move after that. Yeah. So the buyer was a guy called Greg McLemore. Now, when I read his name, I thought it does ring a vague bell. Why would we know Greg McLemore? Well, um, the dot-com boom was a very interesting period. And uh, And the crash. uh, And the crash, (laughs) yes, indeed. And um, Greg was head of Pets.com. And Pets.com was one of the most legendary kind of uh, biggest failures in the dot-com boom. You know, uh, Amazon famously survived that and now kind of dominate the world at the moment. But Pets.com had this... uh, Crazy advertising scheme where they had this sock puppet. You may have remembered it. It was like the Pets.com sock puppet. Like and the mascot. And yeah, was and, and this was to be uh, shown at the Super Bowl. And uh, they kind of started running out of money, but they were like, we've got to keep our credibility up. So we've got to release this Super Bowl advert. And that kind of bust the company. Wow. And then the sock puppet went on to like further fame in the future and and <laughs> what's he doing now just kicking back in Vegas he, he, create, he created a company called Sock Puppet LLC right. and then wow, he's started good. using this Sock Puppet for advertising and stuff so I think this guy's got a bit of a history of um, 
uh, wasted money. <laughs> well, apparently, in accordance to the little interview he's had, he said that uh, the purchase of the uh, Nintendo PlayStation was inexpensive. Yeah, which I thought was really good. But the, if you if you put it back into its context, he was like inexpensive compared to other recent sales. But he's comparing it to the uh, the mint copy of Super Mario Bros, which sold. Uh, I can't remember when that it's was. It's a hundred thousand. But that was a hundred thousand. Yeah. So I don't know why he's like, oh, it's inexpensive. Well, I guess you think that was just a game though and this and, is an actual yeah. prototype console that yeah and to be fair you know, if you're into retro video game collecting you'd think that the the what you know at the moment yeah. as far as we know the only yeah. surviving example of what, the Nintendo PlayStation in the world would be the Holy Grail what i am pleased with though is he is a video game collector yeah he is a vintage yeah. retro video game collector he's not bought he's not like a millionaire who's come out and gone i'm buying that to sell it on or i'm buying that just cuz i can He's he's bought it for his collection, which I think is cool. Like, I would have preferred a be. museum or yeah. somewhere where people could have publicly seen it. If he can display it, that would be nice. Or or, or somehow, you know, have, have a way that people can access it. Yeah. Probably. Well, apparently he's going to loan it to a, a museum, apparently. Oh, oh is cool. he? Yeah, oh, okay. that's, that's gonna, good of him. He's going to loan it at the Nintendo PlayStation to the University of Southern California's Pacific Asia Museum for an exhibit that they're going to be doing next spring and summer, apparently, uh, showcasing Asian influence on the video games industry. Oh, so, cool. Well, uh, California is isn't it? The uh, yeah. home of video games and that. Well, well speaking of... The home of Silicon Valley. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's the thing. I mean, it's it's one of those things that you'd be really sad if it was kind of just locked up in, like, a warehouse or... On my shelf. Yeah, <laughs> even, even that Joe would, Joe would so do that. Like a nasty Joe. Now, let's talk about um, Reggie. Obviously, Reggie Philome left Nintendo not too long ago, and we mentioned he did that podcast where he's kind of talking about, you know, the rights and wrongs and the stuff that he kind of actually stopped Nintendo from getting wrong. You remember they were going to try and change the logo, you know, to that kind of graffiti logo. We talked about that story a couple of weeks ago. So it seems Reggie, or um, as they call him in this article here, the Reginator, (laughs) he's got a history of doing the right thing and stopping companies when, you know, they're they're kind of going down the wrong path. Mm. Well, now he's joined a company that's desperately in need of help. He's joined the board of directors at GameStop. I thought that was really interesting. Mm. You know, I'm seeing it as a positive thing. He's going to go in there and try and help them and all that kind of thing. Or is he just doing it for a paycheck? <laughs> he wouldn't need the money. Do you know what right. I yeah, yeah, I don't know. And GameStop are hardly, they're hardly flush for cash. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like, at the moment, GameStop is suffering its lowest stock price in years. I, I, and I think we'd probably, with the stuff that's going on yeah. at the moment, it's going to take a massive hit in gaming retail as well. Mm. well. At the moment, I mean, it's just over $3.50. It was eleven seventy a year ago for, um, for, a sh- for the stock. Um, five years ago, it was in the $40 to $50 range. So that is quite a decline mm, in, in mm. half a decade. So and recently they've done a lot of stuff you may have read about as well, where they've been laying off um, district managers and stuff. Yeah. And uh, you know they've also had these um, kind of experimental stores as well. We talked about the retro gaming store yeah, that they've yeah, got, yeah. the board game kind of cafe thing they've been trying out too. And Reggie, when the news was announced, he said that the reason he's done it is because the gaming industry needs a healthy and vibrant GameStop. And he looks forward to joining the board to help make it happen. So really, he sees the importance of having video game shops. And obviously, they're like the, the main one in America. Um, so it looks like he believes it can help turn it around. And you think, I mean, a lot of people have been saying, yeah, Reggie's a man. He, he hasn't ever made any missteps. He was there behind the Wii, one of the most successful yeah. consoles in history. Mm, 3DS. Mm. Yeah, and, and the Wii U. So yeah, yeah. he doesn't uh, always get it right. Uh, but, you know, yeah, good point, actually. <laughs> he's got a pretty good track record, though. So... I think it is. I mean, in in terms of comments and tweets and stuff I've read, I'd be interested to see, I mean, obviously the world's a different place since that announcement happened, but how it's affected their share price since, mm. whether that's instilled a lot more confidence when we get through the current situation. Yeah, you know, I think you need these kind of figurehead people, like like Nintendo would have needed it, like like we had Bill Gates back in the day or Trip Hawkins with EA. You know, you need these kind of figurehead name, people with a direction and a, and, a, and a view. That celebrity, you know? yeah, there is, there is a celebrityism to it. If that makes yeah, sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a confidence in having yeah. someone like that, like someone like Steve Jobs, or you know how they push direction. And I mm. think uh, this this might help them. You know, yeah. And Reggie's known as you know he's loved by the gaming industry. Mm. You know, no one's really got a bad word to say about him. He's, uh, he's, he's definitely someone who you'd want associated with your brand. And I think, you know, it, if anything, GameStop are getting a hell of a lot more out of this than Reggie is. He didn't need to do this. But it's, I also think that, I I, agree, I don't want to see the end of game shops. So if he can, you know, maybe his influence can help turn it around. Turn and around I guess maybe he'll, he'll just be in there, will attract good people and will attract the right kind it's of stuff. It's about confidence. I really, I really hope, like, 
he pulls it out the bag and it sorts itself out and then he comes over to like the UK and then we have like like Golden's Kitchen Nightmares with like Reggie's <laughs> Reggie's Gaming Shop Nightmares he comes and sorts game out in the UK he's just swearing <laughs> right. Game Station makes a resurgence <laughs> we know some TV producers let's make this happen so uh, yeah I'll be interested to see how it goes I mean again like, like you said then Ravi and with everything that's going on the moment how is that going to affect game stores I mean I, what, what I don't want though I don't, I don't want a future where the only place you can get video games from is either online or Asda you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. A bit depressing, really, isn't it? So we'll be keeping an eye on that one. And something actually that we're, we're kind of talking about as it happens. I've been refreshing Twitter because we're here recording this um, in the evening when the PlayStation 5 announcements are going on. So um, this might turn out not to be the case in about an hour from now when it's actually been announced. But there's been this rumor everywhere that obviously the PlayStation 5, I mean, the same, that could be delayed now as well because of, you know, the manufacturing issues and stuff. But interestingly, they're going to be bringing back PlayStation 1 compatibility. So that's something that obviously hasn't been in the PS4. The kind of you know, apart from buying them on the yeah on the store. See, I've not seen anything about this, and I've been watching it, you know, refreshing it as well. Yeah. And all I've seen so far is, uh, you know, apparently it's going to be a hundred times a hundred times faster than the PS4. Not yep. more powerful, but a hundred times faster. And they've like shown off like the concepts for the um, display screen and stuff. But I've not seen anything about this being backwards compatible. But I would love for it to be backwards compatible. I'd absolutely love that. That would be like a, that could be a system seller for me. Well, I've used a lot of emulators, and what they seem to be saying in this article on the Express is that you know they're saying, oh, you can get the two forty p resolution, and you can scale it up to four k, yeah. and you can do all of this. I don't think that's quite right because a lot of the games have like limits set into them mm. for resolution like even some of the older games you can't use your thumbsticks on the um you know you still got to use yeah, the d-pad yeah, 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 and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that so unless they're going through every single title and making a set of kind well, of rules too, for it yeah, yeah. Well, there's too many of them isn't there unless they do what like the xbox 360 and xbox one did and the original xbox per title per title or, they, or has they, like they options up, yeah. yeah they update the list like every month it's like here's another 10 games which were added they, you know they could do something like that or have like you know you can have anti-aliasing and times it four and see how mm, that works mm. or have yeah the one thing i think with filters with consoles though you're not going to get all those emulation options they're not going to ask players to go through and set the anti-aliasing options and all that other yeah. consoles <laughs> yeah. are meant to be put the disc in and play it that's the reason people have them over pcs but from what i've read here i mean they've been saying that the it's rumored to support games from all playstation gens the ps1 ps2 ps3 ps4 we know is going to happen anyway um but there's a youtube channel that they've referenced in here called um retro gaming in hd and essentially i think he does what you just said then ravi he gets like um 240p yeah. original playstation games and he runs them through an emulator well, I, I say ps2 is the one that you can actually hit because stuff like Ratchet and Clank, you can actually mm. upscale that to yeah. 4K. But some of the earlier PS1 titles, like oh, Tomb Raider 1, you're not going to be able to do anything <laughs> with that. Yeah. Well, he's got a video here of um, Driver and he's showing the original version of it um, side by side with an upscaled 4K version, which mm. actually it does look like, I mean, that could have been a late gen PS2 game you know, in terms of the, the fidelity of it, obviously scaled up to 4K. It definitely does improve the textures and how sharp they look. Um, yeah. Even the buildings and stuff look, you know, really, really But that's good. that's a PC version that he's yeah, okay. actually running. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, no, you can definitely upscale. But also, if you think Driver was quite a late game as well. Yeah, yeah. You know. How is it going to work, though? Because, you know, with the PS4 and the Xbox One, when you play the older games, you essentially have to buy them again, don't you? I can't see any benefit No, no, so with the Xbox One, you put the 360 yeah, game Yeah, you're right, in, you do. And yeah, then yeah. It, but then it downloads it, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So it probably it'd be I would imagine it'd be the same as that. You put the disc in, you put Resident Evil Two in or whatever, and then it will recognise it's Resident Evil Two, and then it will download Resident Evil Two, and that's why they'll only have initially a hundred yeah. games or something, and ten will come out every month or so. I do remember with the if PS2, they do it, that's what I think. with the PS Two, they had compatibility, so you could put PS One games in, and there would be a slight little bit of improvement. I remember yeah. Resident Evil was a little bit nicer. I don't I don't know about that, but with the PS Two, the PS Two could actually read. Obviously, you could read CD ROM yeah, as yeah. well as DVD, and I didn't actually realise until recently that some PS2 games were still CD. Is it the blue or purple ones? Yeah, yeah. It's like, and I didn't actually know that until recently. So that's how they kind of got around that with because it was built into the it was it was a necessity. So not will it, all games will it need DVD. a uh, will it need a CD drive then or a so DVD that's what drive I, in there? That's yeah. what I'm thinking. Yeah. Like that's you know the only thing I can think of is there's going to be I don't know there's got to be something on there. 
to scan it. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, the Blu-ray drive can read DVDs and it can read CDs. Oh, but can it read? Can yeah, it, read CDs it, it as well? is about much of its compatibility Blu-ray. Okay, cool. But it's well, what I'm th- well, Sony. Though, that's what I'm thinking of because on the PS4, if you want to play an older game, you have to buy them off the store at the moment. You can't put yeah, in yeah, your yeah, PS3 yeah, yeah. discs. So I'm wondering why they're kind of going back on that now when they've made all this. They're making these money on the store, or maybe they're seeing an opportunity. Yeah. You know, Xbox saying stupid stuff like you know, Google are our main competitor and you know in the, with, the, with the next xbox and stuff like that so maybe sony are just jumping on this whole like we are a games console we're not a, we're not a pc we're not yeah. a tower we're not an entertainment system we're a games console so maybe they're seeing an opportunity there you know like they did when the ps4 was being announced and stuff and xbox were being like oh you know you've got to have your digital pass if you want to lend tv your game. tv tv uh, yeah and all that kind of <laughs> stuff so maybe playstation is still just being a bit like well the Xbox, the new Xbox, well, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Xbox how, One Series yeah, X. Yeah, that's how excited <laughs> I am about it. It looks like a computer, whereas yeah, yeah. like PS5, they, I think maybe they're just trying to grab that attention and just be like, yeah, we're still a games console, guys. For the gamers. Yeah. Yeah, so I hope it does happen, though. I'd love to play like my old PS1 games and have them looking, you know, in 4K. That'd be yeah. incredible. <laughs> right then, now, before we get into, uh, I guess, this week, Don Daglo talking about all sorts of stuff, four, four decades of video games, let's give a huge thank you to our very good friends at Harry. Now, I've talked about this on the show before, that you know, I used to actually use an electric razor. I used them for many years. I didn't realise that I wasn't really getting that close of a shave until I tried Harry's. Now, if you want your face to be like really smooth, and it does make such a big difference. I used to get itchy in that after like a couple of hours after mm. using an electric razor, but Harry's is an incredible company, and they've got a really interesting story as well. Now, it's by a guy called, um, well, two guys actually, Jeff and Andy, who are two ordinary guys fed up with overpriced razors, and they decided... They want to fix shaving. Because, I mean, we've all had that way. You know, you, you buy blades and they cost more than the razor. <laughs> I always found, yeah, whenever I go to buy a razor, I always just end up buying a new razor yeah. because the blades are so expensive. It's like, well, I may as well just buy this, which comes with two blades. It's ridiculous how expensive they are. Well, Harry's knew the only way that they could do this and to ensure quality is by buying their own factory. So mm. that's what they did the set up. By taking less profit, they offer great quality products for a fair price as well. And their amazing quality blades are actually almost half the price of the leading five blade brand. Now we want to give you your own trial set so you can start shaving with Harry's today for three pound ninety five. And of course, you'll be supporting the Retro Hour podcast by doing this. So you'll get your trial set delivered to you, including a razor handle, a five blade cartridge, the foam shaving gels included, a travel blade cover too. So all you have to do. You'll be helping out the Retro Hour by doing this. Start shaving with Harry's by going to harrys.com forward slash retro. That's harrys.com forward slash retro. Now, of course, we did set that Patreon up a couple of weeks ago, and we want to say another huge thank you to everyone who supported us. We appreciate, you know, times are a little bit hard at the moment. Maybe not everyone's got the money to help us out right now. Completely understand, but we want to say, if you have made a donation into our um, studio setup cost, you know, we're well on our way there, thanks and, to you and guys. And it's more relevant than ever, yeah. I think, actually, you know, the need for a studio. Yeah. yeah, if we had our own studio, we wouldn't have to record like three shows in here tonight. Well, that, this is the thing. We, <laughs> yeah. we actually today managed to book in yeah. for the afternoon, which we never, I think we've done one afternoon session in 200 episodes. Yeah, yeah. And it got cancelled because yeah. of they said that nobody was allowed to come and visit the building in the day. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, so here we are again at night. <laughs> yeah, and if it gets locked up on Friday, then, <laughs> yeah. you know, we're going to have to do the show from on Skype or something in the future. But, you know, we, are, we have got a plan to build our own studio and we've been asking for your help you know just help us pay the rent and the setup costs and everything and for doing that of course we've got loads of little options and loads of bonuses and stuff so if you want to support us on patreon um the link will be in our show notes or at the retrohour.com and of course for doing it you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming jen's looking excited (laughs) rolling out that red carpet on the retro hour hall of fame just like this week thank you retro hammer gary marshall Philip Baxter and Carl Busby who all made donations into the running of the show and if you'd like to do the same you'll find the Patreon link uh, and the little PayPal donation if you want to do it that way it's all at the retrohour.com now every week we do our little retro picks this is where we talk about things we've been checking out this week a lot of things we thought are cool in the world of retro gaming what have you been checking out then or what's coming up this weekend well I've been doing this for a while but since this whole thing going on at the moment there, there, there's been a movement in china with everybody in isolation yeah it's called cloud raves okay so what they do is they get a dj everybody else tunes in on tiktok or youtube or twitch or whatever streaming service and then they all have a big party well, and what i'm gonna do is i've been djing for about a year now and i've been doing this i never knew it was a cloud rave but <laughs> now it's got an official <laughs> name so i'm gonna do a two-hour set 
on Saturday, live on YouTube. House music, dance music, Euro dance, and let's just party and forget all this. So this is happening tomorrow? Tomorrow, 8pm. Okay. If you miss it, you can catch up again, I presume? Yeah, yeah, okay. it'll all be archived. See, Amazing. Cloud raving sounds awesome. I think cloud raving, though, you need a VR headset and like a virtual club. Are you on the deck? <laughs> How good would that be? <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Make it happen, Ravi. Yeah. <laughs> and you've been checking out yeah, one of your favourite games and you spent non-stop on this game. Yeah, so it? I've been absolutely hammering. I says to Dan, I says, could I just talk about another retro game? And Go he's on, like, then. yeah, of course you can. So I've been playing Final Fantasy VIII uh, Remaster. So not not a remake. The Final Fantasy VII Remake is coming. Yeah. But this is a Final Fantasy VIII Remaster, uh, which came out about six months ago when they found the code again and remastered it i've been hammering it a lot of people say final fantasy 8 is like the one that people don't like to play because it's got a weird really weird summoning junction system and stuff like that but i've been absolutely hammering it this week absolutely loving it if you're a final fantasy fan not played one of the old retro ones in a while or always put off from eight go back check it out it's like a tenner on xbox and steam and stuff been loving it all week absolutely loving it every night my wife's sick of it <laughs> <laughs> well there are a lot of people aren't there like oh I need, I need some suggestions for games to play yeah exactly moment, so there you go um, I've been slightly dorkier I must admit kind of the same probably the most uh, the best dressed in the studio now oh mate yeah, 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 yeah. yeah rocking my Windows 95 t-shirt yeah I noticed that yeah. earlier on actually I did, a, I did a video about Windows 95 today so I had to dress and look the part <laughs> uh, but I want to give a little shout out to a website called Winworld which is actually really good if you are into uh weird old computer stuff like me. Now, this is essentially, it's a massive software archive, an online museum, dedicated to kind of abandoned software and stuff, but they've got so much Microsoft stuff on here as well. Oh, awesome. So if you want to check out, for example, the um, Build 58S of Windows Chicago, the, uh, the Windows 95 beta from August of 1993, you can do that on here. Set it up in a virtual machine. I find it really interesting. It's got loads of beta versions of stuff on here too. So you can kind of see where the development, you know, how things went from certain versions to the next one or the, the UI stuff that took out on that. It's actually really interesting to check out. So it's stuff that you're not going to find anywhere else. So if you want to have a look at that, that's uh, winworldpc.com. And of course, we'll put everything that we talked about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, talking about four decades of video game history, let's get on this week's special guest, Don Daglo. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for our favourite bit of the show when we welcome on this week's guest. And this week, we're going to be talking about over four decades in the video games industry, actually approaching five. Let's get him on. Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, Don Daglo. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now, let's just start right back at, at day one then. I mean, what was it that originally got you interested in games and computers way back when? Uh, actually, the story will remind you of how incredibly lucky I've been. Uh, in 1971, I was uh, going to Pomona College in Claremont, California in the U.S., and I was walking down the hallway of my dormitory, and I was a playwriting major at this point. My dream was to be a new voice of the American theater. And which I now laugh about, but so I'm walking down the hallway and I hear this click, click, clack, clack, click, 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 clack sound. And this is the front hallway of a dormitory. So I walk over to what had been a locked storage room before, and I walk in, and there are two very primitive computer terminals in there. And they said, "Oh hi, we've got computer terminals here now. Would you like to learn how to use the computer?" And I had had two. Exper you know, part of you says, uh, this was scary. No, thanks. I'm going to walk out. I'm not a math major. But my dad, when I was growing up, had always said, look, computers, this is going to be a huge deal. What it is now is nothing compared to what it's going to be. Um, he actually lost a major assignment with a client uh, that he worked with simply because he kept pushing that point and the client didn't listen to him. The uh, So I had that kind of in my back pocket. And a wonderful sixth grade teacher when I was, what, 11 years old, had uh, taken some of us to a computer center so we could see a big computer mainframe. So I'd actually been in the room with a mainframe before. Mm. And so those two things, I've always thought, you know, I'm glad I had those two things in my back pocket because I didn't run away. And instead I said, yeah, I'd like to learn about this. Well, you said you'd used mainframes before. And... Um... The kind of PDP machines were around then. Did you have much experience using it and playing stuff like Space War, one of the early games? 
Uh, actually, the the PDB ten was the that was the machine to which the terminal was tied in the dorm. Uh, uh, we never actually got to touch anything on that field trip when I was when I was eleven years old. So that was my first real access to using the computer was walking into that little room. And of course, what they would do there was this bizarre contradiction because the first thing they would show you are simple text games. Okay, the first one they showed me, I still remember, was a horse racing game where there were horses like numbered one to six or one to eight. And they said, pick your horse. Okay, I'll pick number five or whatever. And they would say, oh, it's at the first turn. Number three is in the lead. Number seven just behind and trailing the pack is number one. And at the halfway point. So you'd get this exciting narration of numbered horses <laughs> running around an imaginary track. At the end, it would say, oh, number three, one, and so on and so forth. So completely random, just a little text generator. Um, and then they showed me Eliza, which already existed, which was the, uh, the computer, the ultra simple uh, simulation of a human conversation where a person was supposedly talking to a counselor or a psychologist. And so what it did is it printed dialogue. If you are a playwriting major and somebody shows you a machine that will print dialogue and print different dialogue based on what the audience does, it is not much of a reach to go, oh, wait a second. I'd know how to do that. I could do that. And then they ask the magical drug dealer words. Would you like to learn how to program? <laughs> well, Why, yes, yes, I would, I told them. <laughs> well, you made a very early game, baseball, in 1971 that must have been the first interactive baseball computer game. How did that come about then, and how did you get to write that program and get the idea? Uh, you know, I'm first of all, I'm a baseball nut, the way that many people are are not in in the UK and Europe are, are are crazy for football or maybe for cricket. I am I am that nut crazy person for baseball, and so I came in with a disease already, and I had played baseball board games a lot growing up. Uh, like many game designers, I was not one of the popular kids. I was one of the nerdy kids. I was very shy. Uh, I still am very shy. I'm just good at hiding it. And so uh, playing my baseball game just by myself, solitaire, was something I did a lot. Mm. So once I learned about the computer, I looked at it and thought, wait a second. I've actually done some redesigns on the board game I play. I could take my ideas and put them on the computer, and that would work great. So that's where it came from. It, it appears it was the first interactive baseball game. And uh, Dungeons & Dragons was a huge kind of craze out. We've had so many people on this podcast that have said, you know, Dungeons & Dragons was the influence for many early titles. And uh, you wrote Dungeon in 1975. Um, was this directly inspired from that title? Oh, absolutely. It was shamelessly <laughs> inspired by D&D. Somewhere uh, springtime of 75, um, one of the people in the theater group that I was informally part of, uh, you know, as a playwriting major, you know, that that's kind of, those are the folks you're going to be hanging out with. And if you have actors in D&D, I mean, just fantasy lovers in D&D is a trip. If you have actors in D&D, uh, then you have insane people playing the game. So I was I was taught and played the game with insane people. <laughs> and so uh, immediately, by this point, I'd been programming for four years. I'd written a number of games. All of this was just for fun. Oh, yeah, someday people will have computers small enough and affordable enough to fit in their houses. Yes, maybe in the year 2020. But this is this 1971. This is 1975. Ha, ha, ha. The computer I was working on cost millions of dollars, and so, but I just did it for fun and to share with friends. And so I started working on it, and by late 75, I had a first playable, which was, you know, not at, it, at its final scope. And then I kept adding to it and adding to it over the years uh, after that. But it, uh, I don't think it ever officially got spread anywhere. 
but I did get fan letters from different places across the country and universities. So one way or another, it, me- it went other places. So I mean, you mentioned then about the fact that you needed these, like you know, millions of dollars of machines, like these mainframes, to play. And obviously, the microcomputer revolution came along so- shortly after that. Yeah. Um, and you were a school teacher at that time. I mean, how did you go from being a school teacher to working at Mattel then? <laughs> I said I was lucky. <laughs> the uh, what happened was, so when I came out of school, I knew that the professional writers who came out of college starved, actors who came out of college starved, and I liked teaching. So I thought, okay, teaching's great because number one, it'll support me. Uh, number two, I like it. Number three, you have summers off when I can write. And so that that was the career I was pursuing, and I spent six years as a as before the industry got going as a bilingual programmer in a uh, uh, a Mexican uh, area uh, neighborhood area uh, east of Los Angeles, hmm. and then of course that gave me summers, and you know you, I had time I could go to the university. I never lost my computer access because. I had it for th- three more years as an undergraduate. Then I got a full ride fellowship at the graduate school that was part of the same complex. So that gave me another two years of computer access. And I was mostly a scholarship student, so I was, again, lucky. And two weeks after I got my master's there, they hired me as an instructor part time at the uh, graduate school. So I got to keep my computer access being part of the faculty. That nobody was lucky that I've heard of was lucky enough to keep that access. Who started as a student? Yeah, they have nine years of access. So the industry begins. Mattel does a test market for the Intellivision console, which was turned out to be the biggest rival to Atari. They do a test market in a medium-sized, small to medium-sized city uh, here in California. Intellivision is very successful with the test market uh, console and games. And they say, okay, we're going to go big for this. And they said, we need to hire in-house programmers. They were they had worked through an outside contractor for the initial games. And so they start recruiting for uh, game design programmers. And I called them up and I said, well, I've been doing this for nine years, but I don't have a computer science degree and you're looking for people with computer science degrees. And they said, nine years. It was like, hey, Harvey, this guy says he's been doing this for nine years. The lies these people tell. (laughs) It was kind of the tone in his voice. And then, of course, they realized, oh, wait, he really has been doing this for nine years. And they said, maybe maybe the computer science degree isn't necessary. Let's have you come in. I came in, did uh, uh, one short round of interviews. They offered me a job that night. And just by that luck of being in the right place at the right time, I became one of the original five uh, in television programmers on day one of the team inside Mattel Toy Company. So just, again, incredible luck. What also makes it more luck and is a goofy story is how I heard about the opportunity. I'm driving along in my car. I'm listening to a, a jazz and R&B station. At that point, I had been promoted into school administration as an assistant superintendent at our district. Mm. And it was very political. And frankly, it was very racist. There was a lot of migration of uh, uh, suburbans and tract homes into the area. And the traditional uh, Mexican community was kind of under assault from all sides. And that was being played out in the school system. And so I, you know, it was not a good time. So I'm driving my car along, thinking this is not a good time. And onto my radio comes a voice that says, "Are you interested in the exciting world of computer and video games?" The planets aligned. The planets aligned, <laughs> and I, my car was a little convertible. <laughs> it's kind of like so. I, I didn't know whether to look up to God or look down to the radio. <laughs> and by, well, yes, yes, I'm interested, and I'm driving along. Would you like to create the future of this exciting new form of play? Why, why, yes, I would, God. Yes, I would. We'll call 213-978-JOBS. That's 213-978-JOBS. You know, when a number changes your life, you remember it. I always try and tell people that. Little things that change your life, 
you remember. And that, that was how I got the job. That's amazing. Uh, radio advertising works. There you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Atari were really established by then. Was there a much of a kind of fierce competition between the Intellivision and their VCS? It was fierce. In fact, once we got going, it was funny because I would go home every night to uh, uh, my wife and uh, our uh, one and then two little little boys, and uh, we'd turn on the TV, and we would see almost virtually every night we would see first of all an Atari ad for one game or another saying Atari is the best system, and then we would see an Intellivision ad. Uh, we had a spokesman named George Plimpton, and he had been a sports writer in the U.S. He was from the northeastern uh, U.S., so he had an, uh, an American accent that was tinged with a British accent. And so he, to Americans, that, you know, a, a British accent to Americans sounds very, very uh, expert. And if we hear British accents, we very often, we just want to do whatever you say. And so... Uh, he was a very effective spokesman, and they would show an Atari screen uh, on the uh, on the television. Of course, our system was was a good two years newer in terms of the technology, so we had higher resolution, we had better audio, we had better pretty much everything simply because of the time difference. And so, on all of those commercials were crushing in terms of how they made our system look next to Atari, and every night we would see them. Uh, this was just and became just it blew up into being a cultural phenomenon in the U.S. Mm -hmm. The problem was that Atari, because it was a more primitive system. Hear how I say that? Oh, a more primitive system with pity in my voice. Um, because it was a more primitive system, it cost less. And so their price point was always about $100 less than ours. And Mattel Toy Company would not buy into razor and blades, even though we made most of our money off of software. They wouldn't buy into that and lower the price. They had to have that margin. So whatever we did during the roughly the three years in which the battle went on, we never caught them in sales because of our price. We had surveys from consumers saying that over 90% of American consumers believed that Intellivision was a better system than the Atari, and yet we could never catch them on sales because $100 U.S. back then is more like, what, three or $400 U.S. now. Yeah. And that's a big, big uh, hunk of money. I mean, you talked about you know the, the more advanced system there, and obviously that led to more advanced kind of games as well. And Utopia, um, often regarded as a first RTS and the first God game, very different to the arcade games that were generally around at the time. What was the story with that game then, and how did you manage to do something so different to the norm? The roots are so bizarre, nobody would ever believe it. So first of all, I had, as, as a teacher, my last four years, I had taught social studies, theater, and English as a second language in middle school, which uh, in the U.S. is kids who are generally 12 to 14 in that rough range. And sometimes 11 to 13. And so in my, in the community where I taught, a lot of the kids had never been out of a 16 square block area. Mm. Um, there was an area uh, where there were gangs, there were dangers uh, to being in the area. There were bullet holes in the windows in the front of the school, a couple up in the corner that were never fixed. Um, and so how do you teach about the world and geography and what you know the countries of the world are like and so on to, to a kid who's never been out of 16 or 20 square blocks, you know, except maybe to go see, you know, grandma who lives 30 miles away. And so I struggled with that. And one day, and I swear this relates to Utopia, um, I was in the school cafeteria. And at night, they had fold-up tables in the cafeteria. And so it's just this big, wide-open linoleum floor. It was linoleum tiles. Well, if you show a gamer anything with tiles on it, you got to start to go, oh, wait a second. I can use the tiles to draw any kind of a map. So that same afternoon after school, I went to a hardware store. I got three rolls of black electrical tape. I took a map of the world. I put grid lines on it. 
I put the electrical tape on the floor of the cafeteria and I transformed the f- floor of the school tech cafeteria into a map of the world. And wow. they could unfold the tables on it, serve food, do it, mop it, everything, and the electrical tape would stay in place. And so then I started designing games for the kids to play, and we folded uh, paper boats and paper planes, and you know I designed games for them to play where they would have to go to France or go to England or uh, sail around the, the southern tip of Africa because the Suez Canal was closed or all those things to give them an idea about the world. So that's part one of this idea of the map. Hmm. Part two is I would stay up too late at night in my dorm at school watching really bad old movies like science fiction and horror movies. And one of these was one of the worst of them was called The Killer Shrews. It's either Attack of the Killer Shrews <laughs> or The Killer Shrews. Shrews subjected to radiation, growing to gigantic size with an insatiable appetite for human flesh. So this, as you can hear, was a bad movie, but I watched it. And so I went back and I thought, okay, well, and this is during my mainframe games. And you start to think, well, exactly how long would it take for the shrews to go after the people who were huddled in a little compound in the middle of the island they were on, mm. because it was all set on this island. And if the people were going to make a run for the dock and a boat to escape the island, which is how they, the, the surviving characters succeed in the movie, sorry for the spoiler, <laughs> and how long, what moment would it be, how would they choose when to make that run? So I thought, well, let's see, there's probably some rabbits on the island. There'd be other things for the shrews to eat. Um, what would be the regeneration rate? And so I did this little sim, because sims were a lot, all these little games we would build on mainframes in the 70s, a lot of them were little sims. A lot of them were tongue-in-cheek, like the killer shoes. And so... Uh, but I had this sim of, you know, how long would it take to the point where the killer shrews in desperation would gnash their way through the walls and consume the remaining humans? And so when sh- the whole point of the game was when do you make your dash? You're watching all the data turn by turn. When do you make your dash? It was, it was not a great game. I didn't work on it very long because it's not exciting to decide when to dash from the dock to escape killer shrews. But it gave me the idea of an island and a sim on an island. So when I first start working for Mattel, the first project we had our keyboard component was was like a home computer, which never shipped, which is a long and tragic story that was a big deal in game history, as it turns out. So I wrote a geography challenge game uh, that was an educational title. And that was kind of my warm up project just when I first got to Mattel. Uh, and that game now sells for hundreds of dollars per copy because the only copies they ever created were for the test market. So there's very few in existence. I don't even have one of my own. Uh, I don't think that uh, in storage, I don't even think I still have one. Um, and then they said, well, we're, now we're going to have you work on a regular cartridge. And so what kind of a game would you like to build? And so I had played, there was a text-based game on mainframes that had already been, uh, I'd seen transferred to home computers uh, called Santa Paravia, Hmm. where you were allocating grain to your population as a sim. And rats would eat some of the grain, and then based on how well you did, you either advanced or did not. And so I thought, well, if... If that's, you know, so that's an idea of a sim that at least somebody thought they could sell to consumers. It wasn't just one of our fun things we did back in the 70s. This this might be marketable. I know you have to, when you're doing anything small, because I was used on, on the mainframes, we had to write small games. The biggest game we could write was 36K. Then they knocked it down to 32K uh, later on. And Dungeon... Getting Dungeon to run in 32K was such a pain. Uh, There was so much revision I had to do to get it to run in 32K. So thinking about having to bound things, and in television cartridges, were 4K. Wow. And so, and were written in assembly language. 
And so, so I had to learn assembly language for that, which I'd fooled with but never learned. And so I thought, well, if you have to bound the world, if we know that doing compact games, you have to bound the world, islands are good. Oh, just like the Killer Shrews Islands. Yeah. Yeah, I've designed a game on an island before. Oh, and tiles, well, just like the cafeteria floor. So if I want to do a sim that's graphical on a video game on the Intellivision, I take the tiles from the, from the middle school cafeteria. I take the idea of bounding things with the island from Killer Shrews. I do a 1970s mainframe style sim, which I've written lots of. And that's Utopia. And I pitched the idea. The original document I wrote is now at the uh, the Strong National Museum of Play. I've given them all my papers. And they have the original proposal. And uh, so that's what I pitched. Uh, it's miraculous it was approved because it was a, it was a cross between a, a pure game and that had educational overtones. And they said, no, never say it's an educational game. Never say it has educational value. It's a pure game. Okay, I got it. It's a strategy game. No education. My lips are sealed. And uh, they approved it. Marketing approved it at Mattel, which is just considering the time that this was 1981 – the fact that marketing approved it is just this miracle. And everybody thought it was a line balancer. It was very different from anything else we were doing. It would just balance the line. And the first time we took it to a tra trade show, it blew up and became the, uh, the, the biggest hit of the show as far as uh, press and publicity and attention and so on. I love the fact that, you know, inspiration just can come from the most bizarre places. And the fact that, you know, you mentioned the educational titles there as well. That was kind of something that they were doing, like you said, on, on the download almost. I mean, there was another one called um, Shark Shark that you worked on as well. <laughs> that I think, was that a bit of a surprise hit, that one? Because I know I read a story that they had to get more carts made because they didn't expect it to be as big. Yeah, Shark Shark came out when the industry was already starting to hiccup mm. uh, before the crash that happened in the U.S. in the really late 83, beginning of 84, where the whole industry just fell apart. But, um, and the the basis for that game was was actually very simple. I had an aquarium at home. And one of the things you have to do with, with lot, keeping fish in the aquarium is one of the standard rules is, unless you know you have really peaceful fish, don't put any fish in an aquarium that is big enough to eat any other fish in that aquarium or small enough to be eaten by any other fish in that aquarium. And so I was looking at the aquarium and they just kind of, oh, wait a second, there's a real simple mechanic here. <laughs> uh, so I r wrote it up, went through the process. Uh, Ji Wen Sao is the name of the programmer who, who actually uh, did the coding on it. By that time, I was either manager or director of game design for, for Mattel at that point for Intellivision. Um, and and G Wen, she did a very nice job on it. She added her own ideas to that. Other team members kicked in things, uh, but uh, that was where the beginning of Shark Shark came from. Uh, well, another machine that um, never kind of saw the light of day was the Intellivision Four, and um, that was <laughs> meant to kind of lead the company into the nineties. Uh, do you remember much about it and uh, <laughs> what it was oh. supposed to bring? Oh, that uh, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> I. That was a wonderful machine uh, had been that they had designed. That was a true next gen machine. We never had a next gen because Gen, what is now called Gen One, uh, was followed by the crash, and so Nintendo in the U.S. really had to bring the industry back. Obviously, in the U.K., the the continuum was very different, but in the U.S. with that crash, but if you picture a primitive machine designed like the Amiga, only picture it being designed five years sooner. Wow. So we had bit planes instead of just having tiles. We had all sorts of these great things we could do that you didn't see again until the Amiga. And so it was a very powerful, a very beautiful and wonderful machine. Uh, I had the privilege of writing the spec for what, uh, proposing what the first six or eight game categories would be that spec was adopted. Uh, that's still one of the things I'm proudest of in my entire career is that the, the company believed that the mix I recommended, that marketing approved it straight off. But very shortly after we started very secretly working on this system, two times in particular in my career when we had 
Well, you had to go past a guard to get into the building or a locked door to get into the building. Then you had to go through a locked up a locked elevator to go to a locked door. Then you were through that locked door. You had to go through another locked door. And only then were you anywhere close to seeing what was going on on a project. Mm -hmm. So it was locks inside, locks inside, locks. Uh, at Mattel, that's how it was with that project. Even The Intellivision area was so secret that our names were secret. When TV Guide in the U.S. did an interview with us in, I think it was either 81 or 82, Mattel said, oh, you can interview the game designers. You just have to change their names when you publish the story. That's how secret we were. <laughs> uh, the Meanwhile, recruiters from Atari are calling every single day, but no, never mind. Don't tell the world who we are. The uh, But that's how secret that project was. It started out as the Intellivision 2, and then as the as different forms of hardware were politically battled up. Uh, uh, over by people on the hardware side of the company, including a lot of politics, the number kept incrementing, but it started out actually as the Intellivision 2. It was announced, but never shipped. The games we were working on were very cool. I had taken some of the very best, best programmers on our team uh, and had them working on the lead SKUs. It was uh, as SKU is stock keeping unit. So it just, uh, it means the lead product. Uh, it was going to be great. It, if it had survived, uh, what, what's the line from Hamlet? Uh, he he was likely, had he been put on, to have been most proud. <laughs> I, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not getting it exactly right. That, but it's uh, uh, that's what that's what the Intellivision two or three or four, depending on the iteration. Uh, that was a beautiful machine. Well, it sounds like it was, you know, up and running on hardware. Then it wasn't just a spec on paper. I mean, did anything actually happen with that technology in the end? Where where did it go? What what kind of happened? They announced it, but before we could ship everything, everything blew up. Hmm. But no, be, uh, internally behind closed doors, we were we already had some very nice looking stuff. We had nice looking games. Well, how much did the 1983 video games crash kind of affect things for you? And um, how did you make that move to electronic arts? Uh, for everybody, the irony is it, apparently I'm the one who coined that term, the the crash. Uh, because my parents went through the depression and they always talked about the crash. And when it happened, that's all I could think of for it. We went from having thousands of jobs in the games industry to having a few hundred. And that happened in about six months. So Atari effectively went bankrupt. Uh, Activision lived on in, it, in the form it was in at that time for a few years because they had tax refunds based on all their pro previous profits, but they could never get it back together enough to be a going concern and essentially were bought out of bank of near bankruptcy uh, by Bobby Kodak when he, when he took over the company. Uh, Mattel so uh, basically so in, in effect sold uh, all of its intelligent material for almost nothing. And actually had to, uh, uh, they had to sell so much stock and, t and uh, uh, take so much new investment that the prior owners lost control of the company. That was the level of disaster this was. Did you see um, this coming then? Did, did you kind of predict it or was it a surprise? No, what, the, the roots of it, and I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but uh, some of the published materials on this are based on an old interview I did. The one sentence answer is in 1982, so many companies rushed into the video games industry that we manufactured collectively two years worth of product in one year. And said all these little companies trying to recruit established game developers uh, from Atari, from uh, Mattel, later from Coleco. And they had outside investment. They were started by different companies. This was such a gold mine that the Quaker Oats cereal company started a video game division trying to get in on the gold rush of video games. And this was 81 or 82. So you have all lots of people who have never done a game before trying to figure out the systems, rushing out very primitive games. Not, not that 4K games weren't primitive a lot, but they're trying to rush out these games. The games, of course, are pretty awful because they're still learning the system and people didn't give them time to create the game. So all these new companies and retailers are selling everything so they take this new product into an inventory. 
So fast forward three months, none of it sells. So the retailer calls up this startup company and says, uh, okay, well, you know, the, the first round of products didn't sell. We're going to send them back. Uh, let's try again. Do you have some better new products you think will sell better? Or we'll just take a refund. Because the toy industry and the games industry is a consignment industry. Retail doesn't pay you for product permanently until product sells through to consumers. So if you send a game to retail, either in a toy store back in the old days or to a reta- games retailer today, and it doesn't sell, they get to send it back. Mm. And so these little startups all went, uh, well, uh, w- w- we didn't factor for that because everything was selling. We already spent the money and our new games, are, our second round of games isn't ready yet. We can't refund your money. And they said, the retailers, of course, said, no, you don't understand. This is the toy industry. You don't get to say that. So all these companies now have these debts, which it turns out are so strong that they have to go bankrupt in order to escape the retailers. All these little companies start folding. The retailers are now left holding all this product. So now they know what you do. Okay, this is bad. This is not good. We're we're going to be much more careful with what video games we buy. And they start to blow stuff out on discount tables. In the U.S., the typical price back then was about $35 for a game, which today would be close to $100 in spending power. Uh, the, so they start putting them for 20 and they don't move. So they end up going for 5 and $10 each. Mm. Now, most people blame Atari for the crash, and that's simply not accurate. Atari exacerbated the crash because they started trying to rush out new products and they didn't allow them proper time. So the ET game that everybody hears about, yes, it was rushed out. It was not good. They, they thought they'd sell a lot. So they made a lot of copies. Uh, Pac-Man game was rushed out. wasn't given a lot of time. So now you had on top of the core problem of games already, you know, bombing companies going out of business and being on the discount table now you have a couple of bad games rushed out by an established company on top of it. It didn't help, but that's not the cause. It was one more symptom. In the toy business, retailers are taught you have fads. When the fad starts to fade, get rid of the inventory quickly because in, to- in the toy business, and back then we were considered part of the toy business. The fads go away quickly. You'll lose all the money you ever made if you hold on too soon. Get out quickly when the fads start to fade. And the toy makers said, ah, video games are a fad. Video games are going away. We made money off of them, but dump them now, guys, because this is the time to get out. So within a, a period of a few weeks, as that happened with the big retailers, all the orders dried up. And all these symptoms had led led to it. All these moments had reduced orders, increased skepticism. The bloom was off the rose uh, at that moment. And the toy companies were told, just don't send us any more video game product. We're sending everything back. And this was hundreds of millions of dollars worth of product either projected to sell or already in inventory in the channel. And none of the companies, none of the companies could deal with it. That's why they wave after wave of layoffs. It all came tumbling Uh, down. It all came tumbling down. And our first layoff was spring of 1983. And then through the summer, more waves of layoffs. And you mentioned Electronic Arts. Trip Hawkins, who I think you've talked to, from uh, who's the uh, founder and CEO of Electronic Arts. uh, Trip called me up. And we had met at a conference earlier that year. We were talking, and uh, so... (laughs) The timing was awfully good because I started talking to him about coming to Electronic Arts. And within two days, I was called into a confidential meeting with a a senior exec. And he said, we've been told the whole thing is going to go. Your oath of loyalty is released, but you can't tell anyone else. And as he said, you can't tell anyone else. I could see him scrunching up his face because he's an honorable guy, very good guy guy named Gabriel Baum. I scrunched up my face and I said, so senior executives 
and so on and and directors uh, we get to know but nobody else gets to know and he nodded with still scratching up his face mm. and so it, it was very clear what needed to be done and i knew i would have his blessing so uh, we held a meeting i still get kidded about this about the spaghetti plate meeting because you know have, having a, a periodic meeting with the team was normal so I just said, I know it's been going badly in the business. We've, you know, we've had these rounds of layoffs. You know, I just wanted to talk talk openly with you guys about it and stuff, because back at the beginning, you know, when we all started together, uh, you could put a plate of spaghetti on the screen that would sell, and now our very best games are having a hard time selling, and it's very hard to know what's going to happen, and we don't know what's going to happen in the future, and you know, it's right for a lot of people say the f- future looks bleak, and and you know, it's hard to argue with that. And But I just wanted to come in and be able to talk about that. And at that moment, as scripted, my assistant came in, Vicky Dahlgren. Vicky walked in and said, oh, Don, there's a call for you. And I, you know, I kind of, we did this little theater of, oh, I'm, I'm in this meeting and no, you got to go take the call. And so I go to take the call and I asked the team, you know, just kind of to wait. It took about three minutes for people just talking for somebody to say, hey, wait a second, what is, what? You know, what is he really saying here? And one of one of the group leaders started to put it together. And so the, gr- the group broke up on its own. And let's just say we never had to officially tell everybody, but that worked. And there were, I think there were other parallel in the, par- in, in the uh, parallel team stores. I think that some parallel things happened. So, you know, we were able to let people know what was cool for me is I was already talking to EA when I held that meeting. And so uh, in the fall, uh, before things completely fell apart, uh, I was able to start work as, at that time, one of three frontline producers in a, in a little startup that happened to be Electronic Arts. I mean, obviously, they, they weathered the storm and they had some you know, incredible titles in those early days. I mean, one, one that I remember that I, I believe you were involved with was um, Realm of Impossibility. And that was originally <laughs> Zombies by uh, Brahm Software. How did yeah. that end up being renamed and released by EA and what kind of changes did you make to that then? Oh boy, uh, you know, it's funny, I end up going on these long stories, I hope it's okay, I'm giving such long stories to all these things, but they were such fun times. When we, st- at the very beginning of the EA, one of our first investors uh, was a and Records, which at that time was, and for many, many years, was one of the biggest record companies in the world. And so Jerry Moss and Herb Albert, the founders, were investors and they would send record producers for an AMM to help train the producers at EA because there had never been a producer in the games industry before. Trip Hawkins was the one who conceived of that. And so here we are doing this job being called producers and the duties we're doing obviously were done in the games industry to some degree before. Trip's vision and that of some of the other uh, co-founders and early employees of the company was, you know, that this is a new entertainment medium. This is not a fad. This is not a passing fancy. This is a new medium of entertainment, and we have to learn from those established media. So our packaging was like packaged like vinyl record albums because this is before CDs. We were still in vinyl. Uh, and the idea was that the game creators would be treated like the star musicians who create music. So the, uh, the things we were trained in, you would say, oh, but everything you were trained in by record producers must have been irrelevant. No, I still use what I was trained, the training we got from the A&M guys, and I got in on the la- only on the latter parts of it. The training from the A&M producers was one of the great learning experiences of my life I still use every week. You know, if I'm advising a team or working on a project, every week I feel like I still use wisdom they gave me. Um, But one of their core things is, okay, what is the process of the producer? In the music business, it's A&R, artist and repertoire, artist. Find people who are talented. Back then, EA called the developers artists for that reason. Repertoire. Help those people. Don't just publish them. Help them produce their very best work create the environment in which they can produce their great work, give them support and help and help them grow as artists so they can be, sell more and more of their works. And that's the business model. That was the founding vision of electronic arts was this idea of artists and building it in parallel to the, to the music business. And if you think about it, the idea of recognizing the talent of unique game creators 
creating a great environment in which they can create products and then supporting their personal growth and development as creators, that's visionary. That is that transcends every generation of games. That transcends all of game history. It's as true and as valuable now as it was then. How we do it has changed dramatically, but the vision that Trip and the team had was absolutely absolutely intact. So step one: find talent. I'm a new producer. I start looking at the little ads in Soft Talk magazine and Creative Computing and things like this looking for uh, talented people and projects that are self-publishing where a big publisher like Electronic Arts, which where we had 45 people. Yeah, we're a big publisher with 45 people. And at that point, as everything was falling apart, 45 was a big game company. Thousands of people used to be a big game company. By 1984, by early 84, 45 was a big game company. I saw the guys at Brom saw their ad... Uh, contacted them and said, hey, uh, they were up in Seattle and said to Mike, uh, the, uh, hey, I'd love, love to uh, come up and talk to you, you know, about maybe working with EA and maybe we could publish your title and give you greater distribution. So I flew up to Seattle, met with them. Nice, really, really nice people. I still remember going out to dinner with them because it was like going out to dinner with old friends just the first time I met them. And so they signed with us and then we followed the model. We gave Get, provide a lot of feedback. Game was adapted. I think it was already on the Atari 800, and we moved it to the Commodore. I, I don't remember anymore. It's been too long. But we did we did more more versions, made some changes to what they had done. That idea of give feed, feedback, challenge to be your best, support, and so on and so forth. And our republishing of the game was successful. And it, you know, it is a great idea. It was completely a unique game with all these optical illusions on the screen. And the way he got it to work was just brilliant. So uh, uh, loved working on that title, both because it was a unique game uh, and very good people. And obviously, what turned out to be successful. Well, you ended up leaving EA and going to mm -hmm. uh, Broaderbund. And uh, you also oversaw some fantastic games there, like uh, Prince of Persia, which was a a very special game. What, what do you remember when you kind of first saw Prince of Persia? You know, I was the, here's the here's the key to know about Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia is Jordan Mechner. The my role when uh, that product was already going when I when I uh, took over leadership of the entertainment and education division at Broderburn. And one little secret about about Broderburn is internally <clears throat> the company was called Bruderbund. It's pseudo Swedish. Because the founding brothers spoke Swedish. Uh, but outside, that always uh, frustrated people. And so we'd say Broderbund outside and Bruderbund inside. So if you hear me slip, that's why. But Jordan was working on the project. He was nominally an independent developer, but he worked inside our team and inside our offices. And my job, as I have joked for many years, was to keep people from bothering Jordan. Now, I could think of a couple of times I myself bothered Jordan, but... All in all, I think I saved him more bother than I gave him. And when the when Prince of Persia won, I think when the new incarnation won Game of the Year somewhere, I was I was at the awards ceremony with him when we were kind of celebrating afterwards, and somebody came up, and Jordan said, "Oh yeah, well Don worked was uh, part of the original Prince of Persia uh, at at, uh, at Broderbund," and I looked at him and I said. The same thing to him, dude. All I did was try to keep people from bothering you. And he's, and Jordan, who is a wonderful man, Jordan looked at me and said, "Well, that's important." Well, I mean, another big title as well that you had a, a role in signing the original distribution deal for was Sim City with Maxis. And I remember <laughs> reading that that game. I mean, you know, I think it was completed around 1985, and it struggled to get published for years because again, it was very different. What did you see in that game? Then did you see that potential when you first saw it? You know, I think, I mean, if you look at Utopia and then you look at SimCity, the guy who wrote Utopia is going to like SimCity. That's pretty predictable yeah. if we look back at it now. And what had happened was uh, uh, Will Wright had done a game called Raid on Bungling Bay uh, on the uh, Apple II and Commodore 64, I think. But I, I forget which version he started with. At Broderbund that had had you know been okay. It had not been a big success, but it had been okay. Uh, 
it did well enough that uh, we commissioned a uh, Nintendo NES version as one of the four Nintendo NES cartridges we did early in the day. He wanted to take that and turn it into an editor. He was trying to make an editor for that game and then make that into something with a city or he was playing with different ideas with that. And when he came up with the idea for Sim City, the uh, the founders of Brother Bun looked at said, you know, I just don't think this is for us. You know, you can go out and try and sell it to somebody else. These guys had in- intensely close personal relationships. And so they operated as friends and family in some ways, as much as they operated as business people. Now you would never think of an idea that a company had under contract and say, oh, no, you can shop it to other people. That's okay. Uh, you know, just keep it surprised. But that's what that's what the Carlston brothers said to Will. So Will shops around. Nobody takes it. It was evaluated by the producer who sat next to me at Electronic Arts, and he passed uh, because it didn't look commercial necessarily at that time. And I understand why everybody passed on. Mm. So Will meets a guy named Jeff Braun, and Jeff was uh, look. He had he had experience in software uh, publishing and development. He was looking for you know, something fun to do in this space. And Jeff recognized uh, just how great an idea SimCity was. And he said, hey, let's do this together. And they co-founded Maxis. And Jeff went out and found another game that was a, I don't remember the name of it. It was a wireframe uh, air combat game. And because it was wireframe, it was vector is very fast. And so SimCity and the uh, the Air Combat Vector Graphics game were going to be their two first two products. And so they're starting to form the company, and their attorney, or whomever, said, hey, you need to get the rights signed off by Broderbund so it's, everything's clear. So Will and Jeff come, uh, come into Broderbund say, hey, we wanted to clear this and show the game. And Gary Carlston, who is one of the, the co-founding brothers... Uh, came and grabbed me and said, hey, you should come look at this, because I was running the entertainment education division. He said, we've let this go, but, it, you know, it, I thought you'd get, a, you'd get a kick out of seeing this and so on, because, the, the, you know, they're going to publish it themselves. They've, they're, they're doing this. So I came in and he showed me the, the, uh, a, a very mature version of SimCity. I looked at it and I thought, ooh, this is very cool. And I turned to Gary and I said, so we passed on this? Can, can we publish this? And Gary said, no, we, we, we passed. We told Will he could publish it somewhere else. Today, most places, if something like this happened, they would reassert, the publisher would reassert their publishing rights. Mm. But the Carlston brothers and their sister, Kathy, who unfortunately has passed away, those three, absolute straight arrows. And so what, you know, if, if Doug and Gary told you something orally, apart from mis- sincere misunderstandings, their word was their bond. And they still believed, you know, it's probably not commercial, but, you know, w- even if we thought we were just starting to distribu- distribute uh, games uh, for for uh, other developers because Bordeban at that time, you know, I think we had over 100 people at that point. And we, so we were a bigger company and we had a, a strong distribution. I asked uh, Jeff, I think it was Jeff who was in the room at the time. I, I asked, hey, so how about we talk to you about distribution? Said, okay, we can talk about it. And so we you know, followed up on that and we ended up signing it. So we were their initial distributor and that's how, uh, the f- first versions of SimCity, uh, came to be actually, uh, published slash distributed by Broderbund on behalf of Maxis. But it was just, you know, just luck of the draw of, uh, uh, of that background and that link. In 1988, you set up Stormfront, and that was your own studio. You kind of went into the online gaming world with uh, Quantum Space, which was a game on Quantum Link that kind of became AOL later. So what, what was the story there going into the online world? So uh, it actually started in 86. Every story I have always starts years earlier. The, uh, a guy named Robert Gohorsum was working for Podigy and was proselytizing the industry and Robert's had a very long and successful career, but he was proselytizing the industry that, hey, online is for real. It's small now, but it's going to be big. And I met with him, and he made sense in the reasons why he was saying it was going to be big, and that stuck in my head. And in 87, Steve Case, who uh, 
was uh, not the first president of AOL, but was the the chosen successor when the first president retired very early in the company's history uh, for health reasons. And Steve was doing a tour of the West Coast tech and game companies looking for products for Quantum Link because they were about to add a an Apple Link service. They were only on Commodore 64 only 300 baud modems these are old, bod- old modems where your phone you would take the telephone you would call a number there would be beeps on it and you would stick it into this device that would listen to the telephone's speaker and interpret the beeps and boops into data that would transmit very slowly and they were adding an apple uh service in parallel to it and everybody turned them down because it was all primitive and slow and the only two people who said yes, I, I said yes, we'll do two games with you at Broderbund because we want to learn about this space because I believe it'll be big. And then a, uh, the guys at LucasArts started uh, uh, doing a product called Habitat, which uh, was in effect the first social network with graphics and with avatars walking around. So you talk about being ahead of their time. Creating a social network with avatars in ni- starting work in 1987. It ended up being club- called Club Carib when it came out. And so we start, we're the two companies that said, yes, we do products with AOL. So uh, started doing games with them when I founded Stormfront, because of course, by 1988, I knew everything about game development. <laughs> when I founded the company, like the second or third day of operation, I hadn't really told, I told only a few friends we were doing this. AOL calls up and says, oh, we hear you're starting a company. Let's work together. So you talk about getting support from from people. So we started working on product and uh, out of that came Quantum Space, which was a play-by-email game. It was their first fully automated play-by-email game, which was text-based and was our first game product. And after that, you had um, Neverwinter Nights as well. That was the first multiplayer <laughs> online role-playing game with graphics on AOL too. And that, yeah, it seemed like the company was growing at a massive rate then quickly. Yeah, it. I have a lot of diverse interests, and people would always say specialize, specialize, and I knew that specialization was what killed us in '83. So uh, I w- was a big believer in online. I loved role-playing games, and I loved baseball. So we did a baseball game. We did a Dungeons and Dragons gold box game with SSI, uh, and we were doing uh, online games with uh, AOL. And so I had one of those mornings where I just got up one morning. And I realized, wait a second. You know, one of the holy grails of the time, with all apologies to Richard Bartle, was to have graphical multiplayer online RPGs. And an MMORPG that had graphics was the unattainable. But we had seen Air Warrior, which was a, a World War I biplanes, real-time online combat game. Very, you know, very simple graphics. So we knew that could be done. The Kesby had done. And so I looked at that and I said, wait a second. We know how to do AOL games with graphics. We've done that. We know how to do AOL games with text and how to keep things simple. We're working on Dungeons and Dragons. We know how the Dungeons and Dragons gold box engine works, which is the best selling D and D game system in the world. And we have relationships with these companies. If we put the gold box, uh, Dungeons and Dragons system together with what we know about working for AOL X, Y, Z, if we may, if we do these things, it'll work. And so, uh, called up AOL said, I think we can do this. And they said, well, let's talk. And I called up SSI, Chuck Krogel, who's now president of Petroglyph Studios. And I said to Chuck, I think we can make this work. And Chuck and I sat in and talked about it and, and kicked it around. Then we brought in, uh, uh, they brought in TSR, which control, they later sold to Wizards of the Coast, who owned Dungeons and Dragons. So it'd be an officially licensed title. And so we were talking about this and went through a series of steps of, of proving out that it could be done. And we had one very scary meeting in San Francisco when the guy, when Steve Case and the other guys from AOL, which was that back then was still Quantum Computer Services, mm. were in town, and they said, 
we said, okay, here's the pluses and minuses. We had the tech leaders of both companies in the room. So my leading engineers and uh, uh, their leading engineers, the producers. And so we said, okay, this is risky. We walked through all the risks. We said, we think we can do it. And people on both sides, because our relationship with, with AOL was so long and deep, people on both sides were taking both positions. There were people on our side who were saying, I'm very worried we can't do this. We may be able to do it. I'm worried we can't. And there were people on their side that saying, I think we can. And others said, I'm not so sure. So the product was, everybody was saying, this is very risky. There's a good chance we can do it. It's not certain. And we kind of go around on this discussion for a while. It was a very open discussion. And Steve Case turned and he looked at me and he said, well, what do you think? Do you think you can do it? I know I was betting my company at that moment. And I kind of, that thought crossed my mind. I'm betting the company. We weren't big enough necessarily to survive that if we failed because these were our two biggest clients that we were working with so if i failed them i could you know lose the whole thing but i believe we could do it we knew a lot of the trade-offs we had to make i said yeah i think we can do it and he reached out his hand and we shook hands and again in that era a handshake worked we negotiated a contract behind it but the deal was done and uh, in the spring of 91 we succeeded in shipping the first uh rpg that uh, was an MMO for its day and had graphics. You know, Don, sometimes it's a curse that our show is only an hour long. I think we could record easily another two or three hours with you. All these <laughs> incredible, when he just got into the 90s here as well, which is insane. I mean, what what are you working on these days, though, just to kind of to wind things up? Uh, I am I do advisory work uh, most often for publishers, uh, but occasionally for smaller developers on projects that range on everything from game design to business strategy to production. I also advise the strong National Museum of Play I mentioned where I've given all my papers going back to 1971. So I'm, I act as a liaison for them to the games world, uh, looking for collections and support for the museum. And I'm also the volunteer president of the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Foundation. And what we do is we give scholarships to uh, students and early career professionals who are looking to enter or advance their careers in the games industry. And we also arrange mentorships so that uh, industry mentors can support students, particularly those students who start out with less access to resources to pursue uh, opportunities in the industry to make it a more diverse industry. Uh, so that's uh, a cause that I'm very, very proud to support. Well, it's great you still got that passion for the gaming industry as well, Don. I mean, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share stories with us. Thanks. It's been great fun, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.